someone at your company makes a decision about a product you should use. Maybe it's an expense reporting software. Maybe it's email spam. Maybe it's some sort of HR benefit product. They make that decision based on what they think is the right, based on budget, based on what they need. And then they roll it out to the company and the employees revolt. And the employees say, this is too hard to use or this doesn't provide what we need, right? So in that case, you've got the buyer making decision and a lot of cases not taking into account the users. If you're the vendor in that case, you got the company to buy your product, but you're probably not going to get the renewal. So, you know, I think a lot of companies are getting better at that, but I still see that over and over again where they, they get the buyer happy, but then the ultimate users are the ones who dictate, you know, should we keep this product or not? Welcome to the Product People Podcast, where we learn from amazing product leaders about product management, growth, and product ops. I'm today's host, Mira Lamos, founder and CPO at Product People. Today's guest is Jeff Lash, VP Product Management at Forrester, a research and advisory firm. Previously, he spent four years at Elsevier on portfolio management for health sciences clinical decision support. Jeff is passionate about B2B products and creating great product teams. Welcome, Jeff. Great having you here today. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Can you share with us your journey into product management? So I took a bit of a roundabout journey to get into product management, much like I think a lot of folks did. I started my career, I graduated from uh, university, from college in the early days of the web. So I was really interested in technology and I worked doing web design and development back in the days when you would have you know, one person doing the Apache server set up and that same person also designing graphics when, when there weren't a lot of specialized roles. And so I did that for a while, then quickly realized that this was going to get a lot more specialized, that, that the days of generalists, web developers, designers was not going to last too long. I was not really a technologist. I had always been interested in technology, but never really was a programmer. And I had taken some art classes, but I was not a great visual designer. But I found the world of user experience and information architecture. And that seemed like a, it was a good home. Uh, and so I worked in UX for a number of years. And I think that was a good use of my skills and my interests. And it was a great opportunity to really spend time understanding customers and users and making sure that we're designing websites and products that were, you know, met, met their needs and were easy to use. And then from there, kind of morphed into product management. I had studied business and marketing in school, and I always had an interest in that. And it was just kind of a natural progression. And, and probably about a month or two into my first product management role, I realized like this, this is it. This is the, the perfect combination of all of my interests and skills, my business and marketing background from studying it in school my technology interests from, from kind of having been you know, involved in computers and technology since I was really little. And then the background I brought from UX in terms of really focusing on users and customers and meeting their needs. So it was, a, it was a kind of a perfect match for my interests. And also, I think a lot of the skills that I could bring to the table. Amazing. So throughout your very long career, you've been an individual contributor, a product management leader, an analyst advisor to product management teams, and now you are VP of product management. What are the differences between these product management roles? There's been basically three different roles I've played. One is as an individual contributor. And so I think that's what most people are familiar with, being a product manager. And in that case, you, know, you usually don't have many or any direct reports, and your focus is just on managing the product, making sure it meets its business goals, its commercial goals, you know, doing all the things that product managers do. Then when I moved into managing teams of product management, which is what, what I'm doing right now, you have, I think there's two things you're responsible for. One is you're responsible for the products that are under your umbrella. So for example, right now at Forrester, I have a portfolio of products that my team is responsible for. Each person has one or two or some aspects of the products that they are managing, but then also I'm responsible for the, the portfolio of those products. But in another sense, I'm also responsible for the the team of product managers and the, the product management professionals. And I've got a great group of, of people uh, that I work with right now. And part of my job I see as a VP is to, you know, we're, I'm managing the product management organization. So kind of the, the product org in it of itself is a product, making sure that we have the right skills, the right competencies, we're doing the right things in the right way, our technology, all the things that we do to support. So not only are we delivering good products, but, but you know, we're delivering a product management organization to the company. And then the third role I've had is as an advisor. So I spent about a decade at Serious Decisions and then at Forrester after Forrester acquired Serious Decisions. I spent about a decade, you know, writing research and guiding 
product management leaders and their teams on best practices. And in that sense, you know, I was managing a product because this was you know, the advice and guidance and research was something that we were selling, but also, you know, that role is a bit different, right? You know, I was rather than doing things myself, it's about enabling and coaching and guiding and answering questions and giving people the, the recommendations and the, the encouragement and the direction that they need be, to be able to implement those things themselves. So it was actually really interesting and gratifying in many ways to see, to be able to have impact on organizations beyond just, you know, one product that I was managing or one team, but to be able to work with dozens or hundreds of companies over the years and, you know, see the impact of helping them improve their approach to product management. So how did the, all this shape up your approach as VP of product management role? You already touched upon something super important. You are managing a portfolio of digital products and you're also looking to deliver a great product organization that will impact and help have these great products. So in my role right now, uh, I have a, a large portfolio of research products. We have over a dozen different research services that we have in our flagship Forrester Decisions product portfolio, as well as we have a lot of other products such as our reprints products and certification and Forrester Market Insights and a lot of other products that Forrester has in our portfolio. And when I first came into the role, I kind of half jokingly said, oh, you know, all those things I'd been telling clients to do over the years, now I'm going to try to follow that advice myself. But really, that is true. I think the fact that I spent so many years as an analyst, as an advisor, as a consultant, whatever you want to call it, you know, really helped me because a lot of product management professionals, they bring their own experiences to the table. And those are great experiences. So whether you've worked for one company or whether you've worked for five or 10, that's fantastic experience you can draw on. But it's still only your own personal experience. And I think one of the things that really helped me out was that when I became an analyst and started working with all these different companies and working with colleagues at Serious Decisions and colleagues at Forrester, and being able to tap into their experiences as well, it just really gave me a much broader sense of examples to draw on. So rather than being limited to the one or two or five products I manage or the couple of companies I worked at, I can think of examples from dozens of different companies that I've worked with over the years. You know, some more successful than others, to be honest. And I think also a lot of times, you know, I, I can learn from seeing what companies are doing well, but also learning from mistakes of other people, you know, clients coming to us and saying, hey, we're having trouble doing X, Y, and Z. And I can ask them, well, you know, how did you get to this point and learn, okay, well, here's the challenge, you know, almost have a sixth sense of understanding. This is why you had this problem. And I've seen five other companies go through these same steps. Here's my recommendation for what you can do going forward. And it doesn't guarantee success, but being able to learn from the successes and, and challenges of others, I think has really helped me out in giving me a broader set of experiences and just a lot you know, kind of more turns at the crank, so to speak, to, to rely on. That is great. And also a perfect segue into our B2B versus uh, B2C part of the conversation. So you, you mentioned that seeing a lot of companies helped you learn from the mistakes of others. What do you see as a big difference between B2B and B2C products? And then we will go into how does this affect the work of B2B versus B2C PMs? Yeah, so just th there certainly are differences. And I think a lot of what I see is people who've only worked in one, not really understanding the nuances uh, of, of each or, or how the differences are. So just to set some definitions, when I talk about B2B, right, this is products that are sold to and used by different businesses. So you can think of, you know, a content management system or an electronic medical record system or expense reporting software, right? Something that is sold to a business, a business buys it and a business implements it you know, for their employees versus when I say B2C, I'm thinking of something that is really, you know, an individual would purchase and use themselves. So any sort of direct to consumer e-commerce, you know, an app like Uber or Lyft, right, where it's an individual using it, maybe a banking app that a bank creates that an individual can use for their electronic banking. So I, I think there's a number of differences, you know, there are products that can be sold and used by businesses and by individuals. But I think primarily my experiences and where I've seen the differences are ones that are, you know, strictly B2B or almost exclusively B2B versus B2C. And, and I think there's kind of five key differences. So maybe I'll, I'll list them out. We can dive into a couple of them. I think the first is just who the users are and who the buyers are. So in a B2B environment, 
you have multiple stakeholders, you, you have what we call a buying group, you have different roles in the buying process versus B2C, you know, usually the person who is making the buying decision, you know, deci deciding, am I going to spend money on this app or not, is the same person that's using it. And so I think it's a little bit more straightforward in that sense. In B2B, you have to deal with the needs of different stakeholders and how they work together or sometimes don't work together in terms of the buying decision, but also they have different requirements and what they need in the product and what they expect to do. They um, also have different goals and that can also slow down the process because the buyer is not the user. So you still need to solve for the user to some extent, but also yeah. understand what's the trigger for the buyer to select you over all the other competitors out there. Yeah, it's, absolutely. It's, and, it's and I think, very hard. Yeah, I think also, you know, so not only are they not aligned, but sometimes they're working against each other. So as an example, I spent a lot of time working in healthcare and in healthcare, you have these opposing forces, right? So for example, the hospital administration may want a certain thing to happen and the doctors might want something else to happen. You know, the hospital administration wants everything coded correctly so they can maximize their billing. The physician just wants to make sure the patient is treated well and they can not be there till midnight and go on to the next patient, right? So a lot of times you have different personas that either have different needs and requirements or it's that sometimes conflict. And so it's having to manage, you know, try to keep all those people happy and also think about, well, ultimately, who's going to make the buying decision, but then always also who's going to make the renewal decision may not be the same person as well. That's super interesting that there's another decision maker for the renewal part of the contract. Would you have an example for that for people who haven't worked in B2B and haven't been exposed so closely to sales, especially in B2B? Yeah, I think a lot of us, and maybe it's not that there's a different person, but maybe there's a different process. So I'll give a classic example that probably most of you listening have experienced, right? Someone at your company makes a decision about a product you should use. Maybe it's an expense reporting software. Maybe it's email spam. Maybe it's some sort of HR benefit product. Uh, they make that decision based on what they think is the right, based on budget, based on what they need. And then they roll it out to the company and the employees revolt. And the employees say, this is too hard to use or this doesn't provide what we need, right? So in that case, you've got the buyer making decision and a lot of cases not taking into account the users. If you're the vendor in that case, you got the company to buy your product, but you're probably not going to get the renewal. So, you know, I think a lot of companies are getting better at that, but I still see that over and over again where they, they get the buyer happy, but then the ultimate users are the ones who dictate, you know, should we keep this product or not? And so I think that's a great example of we need to make sure that we have a product that meets our buyer needs, but it has to meet our user needs and it has to be easy to use in order to make sure that we continue that relationship with that customer. Yeah, we, we totally had that, especially with applicant tracking systems, as we had a simple one back in the earlier days where our recruiting was also less complex. And then we got a more expensive one that also had an onboarding fee and a bunch of complex migration. And the first year, it was a bit wasted because the people didn't know how to use it. As you can <laughs> imagine, talent acquisition people are like not the best at configuring triggers for certain actions and email templates. And we actually got good at using it when one of our lead PMs took the recruiting process as an extracurricular initiative to polish out and, and then did better than all the talent acquisition people we ever had on that because they read about the tool and figured out how to use it and how to automate some parts very well, which is interesting because this tool is relatively powerful, but also quite expensive. And unless you set it up correctly, it's just frustrating for everyone to use. So I could definitely understand the renewal part because I wanted to cancel it multiple times and just go <laughs> out, go back to the cheaper ATS that we had. And thanks to this person figuring out how to use it, we're still on it. And now I see it has some powerful capabilities, like you can publish the same job ad in multiple geographies, but it tracks to the same job ad. So you don't have to look at 50 job descriptions separately. So there are a lot of cool things, but it's it's kind of like buying a Ferrari when you just need like a small electrical car made by yeah. Volkswagen that, you know, it's good enough. Hey, if you're enjoying this Product People podcast, check out our weekly live streams on LinkedIn and YouTube. Back to the episode. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great story. Also, I, I've and I actually worked in uh, the recruiting software industry for a little while. So I, that that resonates with me. I think a great another great to extend that right. You have maybe a, a, a example the people who are making the decision on which ATS, which recruiting software to use, 
are the people in the HR department, but users of that software include the hiring managers. So if, for example, if the hiring managers are not involved in the purchase decision process, but they have to use the product, they might revolt and they might not want to do it. So that's a great example of, you know, it's not just buyer versus user, but you also have many different user populations in a B2B environment, which is just again, makes it more complex. And you, know, you also hit on something that another difference between B2B and B2C, which is the idea of setup and integration, right? For, for many consumer products, you know, buying the product and using it is fairly simple, right? So again, think about an app that you download for an app store or think about a banking application you use with your online bank. There's not a lot of integration or setup. You kind of generally should be able to get up and running pretty quickly. But when you think about a lot of B2B software, an ERP system, a product information management system, an applicant tracking system, an electronic medical record. Again, these are things that you don't just buy one day and start using the next. In many cases, there's weeks or months or in some cases, years of setup and needed. And, and certainly a lot of with the move to SaaS, I think that those timelines have gotten a lot shorter, but there's still usually some integration between other things. So, you know, this applicant tracking system needs to feed into our HR system so that way once we hire someone, we can we don't have to re-enter the data or we need to make sure that this uh, expense reporting system tracks in with our financial reporting system. It's just it's just a lot of complexity. There's just a lot more complexity and a lot, not all, but a lot of B2B software and making sure that the, the software it works as part of a workflow, not just on its own, right? I've got a bunch of apps on my phone. I use each app separately, but each app kind of runs independently. But in a B2B organization, a lot of times, one system feeds another system, one software interacts with another software. And so the integration and the complexity as part of a workflow is really important to consider. Yeah, and this is why the current pricing at Miro is that you have basic plan, then you have a more expensive plan where one of the key features is that they allow you to populate the user list based on your Active Directory, Microsoft, or mm -hmm. the active users you have on your Google suite. And it felt like very expensive jump just for that. But I understand if you get big enough as an organization, you don't want to manually add and manually remove each individual from each of these uh, collaboration software tools. So it's, it's a very clever pricing that they figured out that the customer base that buys that subscription is willing to pay almost double for just being able to not deal with manual user removal. Yeah, it's, it's funny. Addition. You know, the amount of, you know, as a user, you go to a, a screen and you look at a drop down. There's just a list of things in that drop down and you think, oh, that's so simple. But to your point, there's a whole bunch of stuff that has to happen behind the scenes to make that work. And I think that, you know, when I see people who have moved from B to C into B to B, they usually underestimate the amount of complexity that's involved behind the scenes to make some of those things happen. And again, I think it's gotten better in the past decade or so. More B2B software, you know, it used to be that any B2B software you bought, you had to buy professional services. You had to pay for installation and setup. And there's certainly a lot of products where that is not the case anymore or where a lot of the setup and configuration can be done by customers themselves without having to engage professional services, but not entirely. And certainly some industries are more advanced there than others. Yeah, that, that's definitely true. And it also depends what's the setup out there because sometimes you just need on-site provisioning or other more white glove type of approach rather than the easier PLG approach to use Notion, you just sign up or you just whitelist your domain and then everyone with that domain can join. So there's definitely different difficulty of adopting that software and working with it inside an organization. So you mentioned one of the difference that people moving from B2C don't understand the complexities in B2B, especially integration with other tools within the ecosystems of uh, companies, which responsibilities have you seen B2B PMs having that B2C PMs don't have? So it certainly depends on the products, right? When we talk about, you know, what types of products, is, there's a lot of variety of B2C and B2B, but, but in general, I think maybe the two, I'll say the two areas that I see that are the biggest wake-up calls, let's say, for folks in B2B, number one is pricing. And number two is working with a sales force. So let's say pricing first. So B2C pricing, usually fairly straightforward, right? You can see the pricing for your competitors. If I have a, an app that I'm trying to sell, I can go and see what other apps, you know, like that and what they charge for. If I'm managing a 
product that is, a, you know, an online baking application that may be provided by the bank for free. If you're a client, I can go and sign up for a bunch of other bank accounts and I can see what that experience looks like, but there's no explicit price there. But for B2B, a lot of times, you know, pricing is much more obscure. It may be more custom and tailored. You know, it's also pricing is something that a lot of professionals, even fairly experienced product management people don't do a lot. So you maybe get really good at writing requirements or user stories or um, doing customer interviews because you do them a lot because in a given day or week or month, you might do a bunch of them. But most people don't price products that often. So you just don't get as many chances to try it. So I think that's a big adjustment. And, and when I was an analyst, I worked with a lot of clients that, you know, maybe they had been in product management for 10 or 20 years and they were still fairly novice at pricing just because they didn't have much experience doing it or they did it so infrequently, you know, that can have a huge impact on the success of the product, you know, how, how well you price it, not just the, the price point, but how you package it, your pricing strategy and things like that. So that's a, that, that's a skill that I find a lot of people coming into B2B just, just don't have. And need to develop. And, and the second is uh, almost related a bit is working with a sales force. And that is a big difference in working in B2B versus B2C. And it Which depends on- the salespeople that PMs tend to complain about, right? Yeah, I mean, the running joke is, you know, product managers complain about salespeople, salespeople complain about product managers, right? We always, product managers always say, oh, well, the, you know, the product's great, the, the salespeople that aren't good. And the salespeople say, oh, this, I'd be able to sell more if the price was different or if it had some features, right? And, and there's, you know, some, some truth to them, some, some organizations, but I think working with a sales organization is so, so critical because bluntly, if your product is sold through a sales force and your salespeople are not convinced, if they're not incentivized to sell that product, you will not be successful. You can have the best product in the world, but if there's not the right incentives in place or your salespeople don't know how to sell it, they don't know how to position it. They don't know how to position against the competitors. They don't know how to address pushback from from prospects and clients. Again, it doesn't matter how great your product is, you will not be successful. I've worked with lots of different you know, sales groups over the years. And, and generally I, I like working with sales. I think you know, they have a valuable role to play and not just in you know, trying to get the deal, but really in understanding the needs of that unique and specific customer and being able to tailor a solution to them. And also they, many of the great salespeople provide lots of great feedback in terms of ideas and suggestions, but it's a very challenging environment if you're not used to that. If you're used to just creating a product and putting out there and doing some marketing, then adjusting to working with a direct sales or an indirect sales force is, is, is a big skill set that needs to be developed that I, that I find a lot of people coming from more of the consumer side just have not had experience doing that. doesn't mean they can't learn it. It's just not something they had to deal with before. Oh, 100%. And at the same time, the salespeople have quite a lot of pressure on them because a PM doesn't get fired if the quarterly sales results are looking great a salesperson may get fired. So they have also a tremendous pressure on them to close these deals or to make the revenue projections that they had to come out, out of the blue many times. So having also worked with sales closer, I now have gained a lot of empathy for this mm -hmm. role because I see it's, it's to some degrees harder than product. Yeah, I think empathy for salespeople is an important skill set to have in product management. I like to say product management is a next year's job. Because a lot of times, especially in B2B, certainly in B2B, the work that we're doing is not really going to have an impact until next year. So in B2B, you have long sales cycles and you often have long-term contracts. For example, let's say I talk to a customer today and I come up with a fantastic idea for a new feature that I think will improve retention and will increase sales. Well, you know, it's going to take some time to do some more research on that, to validate it, to develop it. You know, maybe we can rush it and get it out, you know, in the next couple of weeks or, or month or whatever. But a lot of our clients, in my case today, a lot of our clients are on annual or multi-year contracts. So me launching that new feature a month from now is not going to have a revenue impact two months from now. It's going to help hopefully secure the renewals that we get later this year. At the end of a two-year contract, it might help with that renewal. We might get some upsells along the way. Even in the best case, if it's a, you know, if you're dealing with a three or six month sales cycle, it's going to take at least three or six months to get that, the first uh, customers that you were able to win because of that new feature along the way. So there's just a, a big delay. And again, I think that's a big change for people that are used to dealing with, especially high volume B2C, where you can, you know, do some A-B testing today and make the change tomorrow and see the impact on advertising revenue on like by Friday. Like 
this is a, a very different model. And so, yeah, so to your point, you know, product management is looking ahead and, and a lot of the impact of the work we do won't be felt right away. But for salespeople, it is, you know, yeah, I've got a monthly quota or I've, I've got a quarterly quota to hit and, you know, I'm doing whatever I can to, to hit that number. And so I think, you know, my best experience is working with salespeople is to really, you know, develop a good partnership and, you know, they have slightly different goals than we do, but hopefully we're all aligned around. We want to make the product successful. We want to make the company successful. We want to make our customers happy. And so I think kind of recognizing that that's the North star that we're all shooting for is we're just have different responsibilities and approaches in getting there, I think is, is where some of the nuance comes in. That that's an amazing line as well as your insight that product management is B2B. It's a next year's job because it takes until next year to make a visible revenue impact, especially if you have longer sales cycles, as well as contract renewals that may be influenced by what you did and which you're going to see then in uh, the revenue projection for next year. This is an amazing insight, Jeff. So thanks a lot. One last question before we roll out. What's your advice for people looking to move from B2C into product management? I think... B2C product management sometimes is the more, you know, seems more exciting, right? People are always looking at, oh, well, you know, Amazon or Facebook or I used to say Twitter. I don't think people as much anymore look at Twitter, but, you know, you know, Apple. And, and certainly those are great companies and there are lots of great B2C companies that are doing exciting things. But there's a lot of really interesting stuff happening on the B2B side. It may not get the the headlines that, that your your relatives and neighbors hear about, but there's a a huge part of our economy is really driven by what's happening on the B2B side. So I think just recognizing that it may take a little more work maybe to find who those companies are or find more some of the more innovative ones. And I think just approaching it with a sense of, of curiosity. So if you maybe you worked on a product that was a super high volume product where, you know, every day there were millions and millions of people coming, you know, there's a lot that you learn and a lot of experiences that you have that are super valuable. But when you're selling a product that is used by 10 banks and that's it, <laughs> and there's only, you know, five people in each bank that are using it, right? That's a very different type of product you're managing. So I think understanding that some of the skills and techniques in B2C do not work or do not work nearly as well in B2B, I think just kind of recognizing that and, and approaching with the curiosity of, right, what what don't I know? So yes, you you have a lot of skills you can bring, but Again, it is a bit of a, a different world. And, and I'll say for my part, I've spent more of my career working on the B2B side. So if I went to a super high volume, sort of very consumery product, there's probably a lot I wouldn't know either. So I think just recognizing what skills do carry over and what skills don't, trying to find an organization that can leverage your experience, but also give you an opportunity to learn and, and be curious about some of those aspects that you maybe didn't get to do or didn't do as much on the B2C side. That's great advice. Look at what skills carry over, stay curious and ask yourself, what don't I know about this? Yeah. Jeff, thanks a lot for coming. This was an amazing podcast. Thanks for listening to this Product People podcast. If you found it useful, please subscribe and consider giving us a rating. For more info, visit getproductpeople.com and see you next time.